I reflected on the recent weeks, struggling to pinpoint any specific evidence that would suggest she was cheating. The sense of unease within me resulted from various small incidents accumulating, leaving me with an unsettling feeling. While I sensed something was amiss, I couldn't identify it precisely. Although I was fairly certain that something was happening, I lacked proof and details regarding who, what, or where it might be occurring. Doubts about my own sanity surfaced, questioning whether I was overreacting or imagining scenarios of her infidelity. Despite my uncertainty, my gut was in turmoil, indicating that something indeed was going on. It could be the early stages of a fling or affair, perhaps a one-time occurrence. Strangely, the more I dwelled on these thoughts, the more convinced I became. I had been grappling with these concerns for what felt like weeks, but how long had the situation been unfolding before I became slightly aware that something was wrong? I took another sip of my JD, signaling the bartender, who nodded with a half-smile, having seen that troubled look many times before. Surveying the quiet bar, filled with indistinct chatter, I noticed a lack of joy. The patrons had bland, unremarkable faces, all nondescript and average. The only woman in the place, in her forties, possibly overdressed for the time and place, seemed a bit desperate, receiving drinks from an older guy. He appeared hopeful, though looking at her, he didn't need to try so hard, she already had his number. Other patrons were merely passing time while the rain outside fell, further dampening spirits. Soon, each would run out of reasons to stay in the sanctity of the bar and head homeward. I remained undecided about my course of action. I turned towards the voice, and there she was, looking at me with eyes that seemed to peer into my soul. As I attempted to respond, words eluded me. In the dimly lit bar, water dripping from her, Sammy started to remove her coat, and I questioned her presence. Curious, I asked why she was here. Sammy explained that she was worried about me, sensing that she would find me at the bar. She suggested we talk. I stared at her, wondering about her motives. Could I trust her? To steady myself, I took a sip of my JD and ordered her a vodka and soda. We waited for the bartender to move away before resuming our conversation, our eyes conveying uncertainty and a subtle struggle for dominance. Sammy pointed out that my recent behavior had caught her attention, sensing that I carried the weight of the world on my shoulders. I looked into her brown eyes but quickly averted my gaze. There was an unspoken understanding between us. I assured her that everything was okay between us attempting to downplay the situation. However, she wasn't convinced. My heart sank as I realized my attempts to minimize the issue were futile. Placing her glass on the tab, Sammy locked her fingers together, leaning slightly forward. She told me she knew what was going on. Confused, I feigned ignorance, but Sammy insisted we move to a booth for privacy. Reluctantly agreeing, I asked her what she thought she knew, attempting to deflect the conversation. Sammy saw through my bluff, asserting that I couldn't lie to her after our long history. She encouraged me to talk, insisting that I needed someone to confide in. Update. I'd known Sammy since she was 17. She was a constant presence and harbored a crush on me when I initially dated her sister Claire, who was three years older. Despite their differences, Sammy and I always got along, occasionally leading to sibling clashes with Claire over the years. Claire and I married after two years, and settled into what I perceived as an ideal future. Both working in decent jobs, we earned enough for a comfortable life. Sammy, my sister-in-law, had enjoyed her late teens and early twenties, and at twenty-five, sought a more mature phase in life. She had matured into someone any guy would be fortunate to be close to. Claire and I had been married for five years, with our anniversary due in another month, contemplating whether we would make it that far. Sammy, an attractive woman and a friend besides my sister-in-law, looked at me with my eyes filling, struggling to articulate my emotions while her resounding, I know, echoed in my mind. Sammy reached across the table, offering support as her fingers gently stroked mine. I felt my heart slowly breaking as she spoke. She mentioned that if I wouldn't say it, she would. She believed she knew that she was cheating on me. Despite the shock of her words, I stubbornly tried to process what I knew and its implications. I resisted hearing more, convincing myself that if I didn't acknowledge it, it couldn't be happening, sparing me from the pain of confronting the truth. Sammy noticed my glassy-eyed expression and questioned whether it was shock or denial. 
she expressed her love for me and urged me to wake up, suggesting that it might be a misunderstanding. In response, I attempted to deflect her and continue deceiving myself. Sammy's eyes flashed with rage, and she exclaimed, drawing the bartender's attention. I assured the bartender that everything was fine. Sammy apologized, expressing her frustration with me and emphasizing her concern for my well-being. She urged me to wise up and face the reality of the situation, emphasizing that we needed to take action. I agreed to start, and Sammy shared her suspicions. She recounted an incident from a few weeks ago when she was with my partner and she received a call on her mobile. Sammy found it peculiar that she left the room to take the call, considering they were sisters. I nodded, feeling a sense of dread. Continuing her story, Sammy revealed that she checked my partner's phone, discovering there was no lock code. The call was from a guy saved as Robert. Sammy didn't know any Robert or Bob, but decided to monitor for any recurrence. I asked about the identity of this Robert or Bob guy, seeking clarification. After about a week, Sammy discovered the identity of the guy my partner had been messaging. He was someone she knew from years ago, before our relationship began. Apparently, they reconnected through social media or chat sites, and their messaging had been going on for a few weeks. I admitted that I had no knowledge of these interactions, only sensing that there were small things keeping us apart. Sammy acknowledged this, but explained that it was all part of what they were doing, nothing overt, but it seemed like things were falling into place for them. Curious, I asked if it was just a couple of friends messaging each other, perhaps reminiscing about old times. Sammy confirmed that it started that way, but hinted that something had changed. I was surprised and asked if I hadn't noticed anything suspicious. I mentioned that it felt like circumstances were conspiring to keep us apart, and there was an obvious lack of opportunity for any fun, too. Sammy stared at me incredulously, expressing a sense of disbelief. I returned her gaze, awaiting her next words. She urged me to pull my head out of the metaphorical sand, emphasizing her love for me. In response, I questioned the extent of the situation, seeking to understand how far it had gone. Sammy met my gaze, and her eyes briefly flickered, providing an unspoken confirmation. My anger began to simmer within me, prompting a quick barrage of questions about when, how, and where these encounters had taken place. Sammy shared that she knew my partner had met the other guy at least three times over the past two weeks. Initially unsure, Sammy only became certain two days ago that the situation had progressed. She had a lunch with one of her friends who worked with Claire, and some information slipped out during their conversation. Sammy discovered that Claire had met the guy twice for lunch, and at least once for dinner the previous week. She asked if this aligned with what I had observed or suspected. I looked at her, as I took in her words. There were a couple of times recently when I had called her office to arrange a lunchtime meet, and she wasn't there, or had just gone out. Was that when she met him? Then last week she had that seminar thing she just had to attend. It was a late notice thing and arranged for after work. She had gotten home late that night, after 12. Thinking back, she had come in saying that it had dragged on and the team had gone for a drink in the hotel bar to unwind before leaving. No lovemaking that night, I remember, and she hit the shower before bed too. My mind was racing. My brain scrambled as I took in these hurtful facts. Sammy expressed concern, telling me not to do anything reckless that could lead to legal trouble. I could sense the change in her expression as I made my decision. I declared my refusal to tolerate the situation any longer and vowed to put an end to it. I affirmed that I would not accept a cheating partner and was determined to make them both pay for their actions. Sammy cautioned me, advising against impulsive actions without a plan. Her words had a strange way of helping me calm down confirming that my suspicions were indeed true. Seeking more information, I asked if she knew where my partner might be at that moment. Sammy confirmed that she believed my partner was currently with the other guy, explaining that it was the reason she sought me out. The rage resurfaced, prompting me to pound the table. People in the bar turned to look as I signaled the bartender. I asked Sammy if she knew the exact location. Sammy explained that she didn't know the exact location but planned to speak with my partner the next day to gather more information. She mentioned that the other guy is married with a couple of kids, though she wasn't sure about his residence. She assured me that she would try to find out more to assist in the situation. I expressed gratitude, 
reaching for her hand and holding it tightly as I wiped away a tear from her cheek. I thanked her for her support, acknowledging the difficulty of the situation for her. Sammy, looking worried, asked about my plans. I assured her that I couldn't act on my impulses just yet, but intended to put an end to the situation definitively. I promised there would be consequences, without remorse, for both of them. In the meantime, I planned to secure what was rightfully mine and gather evidence for my next course of action. As I finished my JD, I signaled the bartender, slipping him a note and telling him to keep the change. Sammy continued to look concerned and asked when I planned to confront my partner. I considered the situation, planning to make some calls the next day while addressing my assets. I emphasized my determination not to give her a single penny. Sammy pointed out the difficulty of being around my partner, and I acknowledged that it had been challenging for the past few weeks. I believed that if she hadn't noticed any change by now, she likely wouldn't in the future. Sammy stood up, expressing her need to leave. I offered to talk again tomorrow and she agreed, promising to find out more for me. She put on her coat, and I stood to help her, feeling her proximity. She resembled her sister so much. As she looked up at me, tears in her eyes, I kissed her cheek, reassuring her that I would be fine. She smiled and left, disappearing into the dark and wet evening. Sitting back down, I took a deep breath, contemplating my next steps. One thing was clear in my mind, they would pay, and the retaliation would be swift, relentless, and unforgiving. Update. I don't recall much after that. Somehow, I woke up in my own bed with a mouth like the bottom of a parrot's cage. My head was still swimming as I raised it off the bed. Rolling over, I noticed I was alone, and there was no sign of Claire. My senses slowly awakened as I heard noises from downstairs. Sliding my feet over the side of the bed, I tried to stand. Waking up the next morning, I couldn't help but wonder about the events of the previous night. As I staggered to the bathroom, attempting to shake off the grogginess, I proceeded to rouse myself. Entering the kitchen, I found her there, inquiring about the state I was in. In response to her question, I vaguely mentioned having a drink with an old friend and getting carried away. Sitting down, I poured some orange juice, drank it and poured another. When she probed further, asking about the friend's identity, my mind started to work. I mentioned a guy named Bob, explaining that I knew him from way back, and he was in town for a couple of days on business. At the mention of Bob, I noticed a flicker of something on her face as she turned. I elaborated, recalling our college days and football years together. Claire seemed puzzled, unable to remember Bob. Nevertheless, she brushed it off, expressing indifference as long as I had fun. It was the first warning sign. Seated across from me at the table, I thought about my conversation with Sammy the previous night. I casually inquired about her activities the night before, feigning interest. I looked into her eyes as she lied about finishing work and going for a light meal and a drink with colleagues. She claimed to be home by 9.30, expressing concern for me due to a late meeting. I knew she wasn't home by then, as I was still at home until 10 p.m., deciding to head to the bar when enough was enough. That was the second warning sign. She continued, mentioning some tasks she needed to complete in the morning and hinting at being late in the evening. Bob, an old friend, was expected to be in touch, and they had plans to catch up. I suggested inviting Bob over, emphasizing the pleasure of reconnecting with old friends. She agreed, and asked if I remembered him, using an endearing term. She stared at me with a neutral expression, attempting to conceal any reaction, but I sensed something beneath the surface. Despite her poker face, I could perceive a hint of emotion. I dismissed her inquiry about inviting Bob over, assuring her that I would manage on my own. I decided to get ready for the day, having more orange juice and a couple of painkillers before leaving the house, ensuring I didn't miss the opportunity to collect my car left at the bar. Thirty minutes later, I departed while Claire continued preparing for her day. As I dressed, I contemplated the situation, my determination growing. This couldn't continue for much longer. I clenched my fists, angered by the thought of Claire with Bob. Vowing revenge, I harbored intense resentment towards him. The workday proved chaotic with a constant stream of calls dealing with issues on the line. My secretary handled some calls, but I couldn't avoid crucial meetings. The tension within me intensified as I navigated through the day, 
fueled by a growing desire for retribution. By mid-morning, the initial rush eased off, and I had some almost free time to deal with my personal issues. I closed my office door and started to check out my financials. Within 15 minutes, I had tightened the purse strings and moved some cash out of reach. I also arranged a meeting with a solicitor to discuss a possible divorce. I still had a few days before that, so my thinking was that it would give me time to get more information. Not that it would matter that much anyway, but it could give me some leverage. Claire had her own bank account and credit card, so there was no need to do anything there. It was access to our joint account that was of concern, but I plugged that loophole quickly, so if it came to it, she couldn't get any more than what was left. My own account was secure and only had a smallish balance. The rest was shifted out and safe. We had no children, so essentially, it would be a straightforward split should it come to that. I had decided in my own mind that we could only get over this if Claire were to confess her sins, so to speak, and seek forgiveness, any kind of reticence there, and we were done. That thought made me feel sad. I sat at my desk in silence as I mulled over what had transpired and the actions I had taken so far today. I needed more information on the Bob character and evidence, or would the fact that I knew about it be enough to really duck the two of them over? The phone interrupted my thoughts, and it was Sammy on the line. I shared that I was occupied with various thoughts and plans, but had initiated some actions. Sammy provided additional information about the guy, Bob Stones, revealing that he was married. She had his address and workplace, obtained discreetly through her friend who had seen Claire with him. According to Sammy, they seemed to be growing closer, despite attempts to conceal it. Acknowledging the start of potential evidence, I requested Bob's details from Sammy. Within minutes, I located his social media page and obtained a photo. Something about his face seemed familiar, triggering a vague memory. Despite the unsettling feeling, I decided to call Claire around lunchtime, intending to stir the container. During the call, Claire explained she had a meeting with a client named Mr. Stones, which added another layer to the situation. Suppressing my emotions, I kept the conversation casual, though her mention of Mr. Stones felt like a taunt. Strike three, I thought, determined to take swift and merciless action against both of them. Ending the call, I masked my anger, promising to see her later and enduring her declaration of love with a clenched jaw. After ending the call, my anger boiled within me. Seated there, I clenched my teeth, contemplating the unsettling revelation. My secretary appeared, poking her head into the office, offering to grab something from the deli down the street. Considering for a moment, I instructed her to surprise me with something substantial, hearty, and rich in red meat, something to sink my teeth into. She gave me a peculiar look, but nodded, closing the door behind her. Sensing that my behavior had been unusual all morning, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was brewing beneath the surface. Sammy visited her sister's office and noticed Claire leaving the elevator alongside a tall, dark-haired man, roughly around 30 years old, Bob Stones, the man Sammy had identified from his online photo. Stepping in front of her sister, Sammy surprised Claire, who seemed uneasy about her plans being disrupted. Sammy explained her impromptu visit, expressing a desire to see her sister and possibly go for lunch. Claire, visibly uncomfortable, mentioned that she and Mr. Stones were having a business lunch and suggested meeting another time. Mr. Stones introduced himself, and Sammy, feigning innocence, asked how long he had known Claire. The question seemed to catch him off guard, and Claire hurriedly pulled him away, citing a meeting they needed to attend. As they left the building and entered a waiting cab, Sammy smiled, observing her sister looking back at her as they drove away. I sat in my office, munching through a massive sub filled with red meat, smiling to myself as I gnawed at it slowly, savoring it while contemplating my next steps. Sammy had confirmed that Claire had left her office, so she called her secretary and found out she would be out all afternoon. Well, isn't that just ducking great? Everything was set regarding my finances, and I had a locksmith on speed dial with the terms prearranged. My solicitor was primed and ready to act as soon as I provided him with the remaining information he had requested. Okay, tonight was going to be the first stage. I was going to really mess with the pair of them for a little while before I pulled the trigger. My old man always told me, don't let them know you're coming for them, just take route one, 
be direct, and destroy the Basts. A man of few, if not direct, words. Maybe that was something I had forgotten recently, but it was coming. It was on its way. Update. That evening at home, Claire walked in appearing normal, and nothing seemed out of place until I detected a faint scent of men's cologne as I went to kiss her. She noticed my reaction, and without verbalizing anything, I gave her a light kiss on the cheek and made my way to the door. Curious, she inquired about my plans, asking if everything was okay. I assured her that I was fine, but had a matter to attend to. I explained that I was heading to Jerry's place for a poker game with a few colleagues from work, hoping it would be a good distraction. Closing the door behind me, I got into my car and left the driveway, grinding my teeth in frustration. Upon arriving at Jerry's, I parked outside and entered his garage. Jerry, a longtime friend with a history of dealing with the police, had combat training, making him the ideal companion for what I had in mind. He was a substantial figure, a friend since school, and I had called him earlier to seek his assistance, and he readily offered his support without asking questions. This kind of unwavering support was exactly what I needed. We quickly slipped into the garage, and I changed into a pair of dark overalls with a matching ski mask. We looked like two mime artists standing in silence. No words were exchanged as we got into a nondescript second-hand car Jerry had obtained. Nothing remarkable or noticeable about it. Cruising slowly across town to the address Sammy had given me, still no words passed between us. We had agreed on the format before, so there was no need for further discussion. Jerry parked the car outside Bob Stone's home, and there was no sign of life with just one visible light. We waited in silence. As the front door opened, we saw him step out, get into his car, and ease down the road. Jerry followed at a safe distance. We already knew his destination, so there was no rush or panic. Parking at the driving range posed no problem, and we stayed in the car. The radio played in the background as we sat, watching and waiting. The tension inside me was almost unbearable, making it challenging to stay still. The urge to step out and walk around was strong, but we knew it was risky. Gradually the car park emptied until only a couple of other cars remained. Both of us tensed as we observed him making his way to his car. Jerry got out and stealthily approached the target. Afterwards, I drove us out of the car park quietly, without drawing attention. Jerry remarked on the success of the operation as he removed his gloves and mask. I expressed gratitude, acknowledging that I appreciated his assistance. Jerry assured me not to worry, stating that he owed me and could never fully repay me for what I had done for him. I reminded him that friends help each other, and pointed out that at least his hands weren't injured and there was no CCTV in the car park. We considered the job well done. Deciding to head back, Jerry suggested starting a card game with the others who would be there by now. We drove back, spending the next four hours playing poker for fun. The atmosphere among the guys was positive, and they understood the situation, providing the support I needed, boosting my confidence for the upcoming confrontation with Claire. However, before addressing the main issue, I planned to play some mind games with her. I stumbled through the door just after 1 a.m., intentionally exaggerating the amount I had to drink. Jerry had arranged for one of the guys to drop off my car. Claire, waiting up, questioned my lateness and examined me closely. I dismissed her concern, mentioning that Jerry and the guys had dropped me off in my car, admitting to having a bit too much JD. Disregarding my jacket and missing the coat pegs, I slumped onto the sofa and looked at her. Claire, with crossed arms and a disgusted expression, sat there. I maintained a blank expression, waiting for her to speak. She couldn't hold back and finally asked, What is going on, Steve? Is there someone else or something? You're acting really weird lately. I chuckled, suppressing the anger building within me, reminding myself to take it easy. I'm all right, my pedal. Just been through a rough patch recently. It'll all be over soon. My words lingered in Claire's mind, leaving her unsure but sensing something amiss. We went to bed, and I pretended to collapse feigning immediate sleep. It irked her, as she seemed ready for a confrontation, but I refused to engage. The following morning, Claire was the first to rise making coffee. I descended the stairs, acting obnoxious, pretending to have a hangover. Playfully entering the kitchen, I greeted her and mentioned my throbbing head. She tossed a headache remedy my way as I sipped my coffee. She appeared subdued, and I noticed her phone on the kitchen table, wondering if she had received any calls. 
Claire noticed my gaze on her phone, and I could sense her desire to reach for it, although doing so would seem odd. Pouring more orange juice, I casually picked up the phone. A look of panic flashed across her face as I had intercepted a message. I briefly glanced at it before sliding the phone back to her, stating that it needed charging to avoid a flat battery and any missed messages. Leaving the kitchen, I went to get dressed, leaving Claire looking after me with a sense that something was amiss. She wondered if I could know, dismissing the thought as she believed she had been careful. Their involvement had only been going on for a few weeks, lunches, dinner three times and hotel stays three times. She considered it nothing more than fun, confident that Steve would never find out, especially since he wasn't going without. The revelation led her to contemplate her recent intimacy with her husband, unable to recall the last time. She pondered if her neglect might have contributed to Steve's suspicions. Hastily descending the stairs, I swiftly exited the door, sidestepping Claire's attempt for a more passionate farewell. Waving and smiling, I pulled out of the driveway and headed to work. Around 11 a.m., I decided to send Claire a text for amusement, expressing regrets for the day and explaining that there was a lot on my mind, assuring her it would soon be resolved. I settled back, awaiting a reaction. Later in the day, Sammy visited me, inquiring about what had happened. I questioned Sammy about her earlier statement, asking her what she meant. Earlier in the day, an employee from the golf club had found Bob Stones in the trunk of his car, badly beaten. Claire had informed Sammy, and she was shaken. Sammy asked if I had done it, and I responded that I didn't care too much either way, denying any involvement. I went on to mention that Claire had told me she found out about Bob's condition through a scheduled meeting with him. His company had called, stating he was in the hospital, and his wife had called them. Sammy found my explanation cute and plausible, but suggested that maybe next time, it wouldn't be so easy for them. I was asked about my cryptic remark, and I replied, saying that accidents happen in the strangest places. That night, upon arriving home, Claire was absent, and her car was gone. There was no message. Irritated, I called her phone, cheerfully inquiring about her whereabouts. She responded, explaining that she was at the hospital visiting a friend, assuring me it wouldn't be long. I expressed my hope for her friend's swift recovery, bid her goodbye, and hung up before she could respond. Thirty minutes later, she returned, looking drained. I asked about her friend's condition, expressing my hope that it wasn't too serious. Claire hesitated before responding mentioning that it was nothing too dramatic. Her friend had just fallen and would be home in a few days. I suggested coffee, and she accepted, thanking me. While sipping her coffee, Claire brought up an incident at her workplace, mentioning that one of her company's reps had been assaulted the other night. I reacted with surprise, asking for details. She explained that he was attacked and left in his car overnight, but reassured me that he was okay. Bob wasn't hurt too badly and it seemed like they wanted to mess him up for no reason. Nothing was stolen or anything. I couldn't help but think about the contradiction, given my prior denial of knowing Bob. Update. She noticed me looking at her and realized she had made a mistake. She tried to cover it up, but she knew it was too late. Now, I was aware of the situation as well. Quickly, she hurried to make an exit to change. I suspected she would be on the phone any second, but to whom? I decided I needed to reassess my plan since things were escalating. I had to move things forward a bit. Calling upstairs to Claire, I informed her I needed to go out for a little while, reassuring her I wouldn't be long. I drove to Bob Stones' home address and knocked on the door. A petite, dark-haired woman opened the door. I explained that I was Steve Ryland, and my wife, Claire Ryland, had dealings with her husband. She looked at me nervously, yet intrigued. I requested to come in for a moment. In the lounge, she realized the gravity of the situation, as I mentioned the affair between Claire and her husband. I expressed my regret for having to break the news and informed her that he was currently in the hospital. She folded inwardly, tears flowing for a few seconds. Expressing her suspicions, she mentioned that she knew he was at it again and decided to divorce Claire. She felt that Claire had enough chances to come clean, and the lies were unbearable. Unsure of how long the affair had been going on, she was convinced of Claire's betrayal. When I inquired about the incident the other night, she admitted uncertainty. I clarified that I didn't lay a finger on him and expressed my shock at the situation. 
indicating my lack of concern about whoever damaged him, I mentioned that I couldn't be sorry about it. I questioned if he might have been involved with another man's wife, to which she responded, nothing surprises me. She decided to keep him out of her life, emphasizing that they had moved back to the area because he was fooling around. Before leaving, I provided her with my locksmith's and solicitor's contact information, realizing the complexity of the situation. As I drove slowly home, I focused on dealing with the other half of my problem. My inner rage was under control, understanding that once retribution began, it would run its course, a course of action I would follow and relish for the most part. The end of my marriage saddened me, but I knew there was no going back from her betrayal. My one consolation was that the parties that caused me pain would experience it in far greater measure. I do not forgive. Update. I guided my car onto the driveway, noticing Claire's car exactly where she had left it just a couple of hours ago. Absent-mindedly tapping the bonnet as I passed, I approached my front door and slid my key into the lock. A heavy feeling settled in my heart, realizing this might be the last time I do this as a married man. Stepping inside, the weight of the recent worries pressed on my shoulders, making them incredibly heavy as I slowly moved towards the lounge. The murmur of the television greeted me as I neared the doorway. There, perched on the sofa, was Claire, her demeanor radiating fear and trepidation. A sense that something was amiss hung in the air, as if the game was up without a word being spoken. Nervously, she shook, trying to maintain composure. I stood, silently watching her, and as our eyes met, I saw fear and an attempt to speak, but nothing escaped her lips. Walking into the room, I passed her to fix myself a drink. Remaining silent, I reached for my drink, my unblinking eyes locked onto hers. She waited, sensing something was amiss. My expression remained impassive as I observed the woman I had deeply loved, now balancing those feelings with the pain she had needlessly caused me. It was time for her to feel my pain. As I stared, she detected no reason for optimism in my face. Pulling herself together, Claire straightened up, deciding to brazen it out. Unaware of what I knew, she couldn't endure the incriminating silence any longer. She asked where I had been, and frustration crept into her voice at my silent treatment. I responded, saying that I would tell her where I went if she told me where she had been. Uncertainty flickered in her eyes as she insisted she was at the hospital visiting a friend. I maintained a blank expression, and fear flashed across her eyes. She was rattled. Once again, she deflected the question back to me, thinking she had skillfully batted it away. I told her to stop the nonsense and explained that I visited a friend myself, someone I hadn't known for long. Our conversation was crucial, and although I hadn't met her before, we were now friends of sorts. I had an enlightening talk with her about her husband, Bob Stones, asking if she had heard of him. Her face flushed as I toyed with her emotions. I explained that I needed to talk to the Stones woman about her husband's infidelity, having discovered his affair. In response to my revelation, she offered concern, asking if I was okay and offering to get me a drink. I inquired about her knowledge of Bob Stone's affairs, watching her struggle to find words. I took the lead, telling her that I knew about her involvement with Bob and had known for a while. I challenged her to speak up before leaving, emphasizing that it didn't mean anything and was just closeness. I scoffed at her excuses, reminding her of the vows we both took. As she continued to defend herself, I called her out, expressing my frustration with her lies. I pointed out that she treated me like a fool, and her attempts to downplay the affair infuriated me. I sarcastically commented on the claim that it only happened twice, and questioned whether it was worth our marriage. She apologized, claiming it didn't mean anything and expressing a willingness to make it up to me. I laughed bitterly, accusing her of being sorry for getting caught and questioning whether she would have stopped if not exposed. I asserted that all the lies she told became second nature, and only she believed them. I told her that she was not the woman I fell in love with and married, and she looked at me as the weight of my hurt started to penetrate her cheater's facade. She realized the seriousness of the situation, and she asked what she could do, promising to do anything. I informed her that we were done, and called Sammy, letting her know about the situation. Sammy would be arriving shortly to pick her up. Claire, shocked asked where she would go, and I responded harshly, saying she could go wherever she liked, even back to the hospital to see her boyfriend. I didn't care, 
we were done. Claire sat stunned as there was a knock on the door. I greeted Sammy and told her to get Claire out of here. I explained that if she didn't leave, I was afraid of what I might do to her. Despite hating what she had done, I still cared about her, but it was time for her to go. Sammy hurriedly gathered Claire's things for the next few days. I thanked Sammy for her assistance and mentioned that I would be in contact soon. As Sammy prepared Claire to leave, I listened to the sound of my wife sobbing. Sammy swiftly packed Claire's belongings into a couple of suitcases, and in less than ten minutes, she was removed from my home. The real challenge would be to get her out of my life permanently and erase the pain. Retribution would help with that. Staring into the flames of the pyre I had built in the backyard, I watched everything of Claire's go up in flames. There was no way I would allow her back into my house for anything,